what your New Year's resolution should be, huge Lightroom catalogs, and a website redesign. Hey everyone, welcome to Keep Shooting Monday number 115. My name is Greg Cazillo from Cazillo.com. This is the very first show of 2016. And I have a lot of really cool stuff coming up on today's show. Uh, first thing I wanted to talk about is the slight redesign of Cazillo.com. Move some stuff around, major redesign on the homepage, not as much on the other article pages but uh, hopefully it makes it a little bit easier for you to find some stuff, at least the most recent content. Uh, move the search box up to the top. I also added a share button. The share button is super important. I really need you guys this year to keep sharing my content. Please, 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 really wanna try and get that out there, get a big push going so that the content is out there, more people view it, more people can see it, and then we can do more cool stuff, get more product reviews, all that good stuff. So please, I'm pleading with you, I'm gonna plead with you all the time, share this article, share the video, and share other content that you're reading of mine. I really appreciate it. Uh, my New Year's resolution for you guys, this is something that I already do, that I've been doing for years, uh, but I'd love to see everyone else do it, is work on your archive, the way you have everything formatted, as well as your backups. These are super important things, and it's a great time of the year to kind of stop what you're doing, stop the old habits, and start some new habits. So I thought of a couple of things that uh, might be important that, that would uh, work out. First, set up a good folder structure. Um, take all of your old stuff and put it inside of a single folder. Start out with a new folder for 2016 so that it's easier from this point forward. Then do another folder for 17, another one for 18, that kind of thing. Uh, start If you start out with a good folder structure like that and a good naming structure for the folders inside of it, as well as your files, it will go a long way into making a big difference and your archives will be much easier and cleaner to find everything. What I do is when I name my folders, I name it with a uh, two-digit, sorry, a four-digit year, two-digit month, two-digit day, and then what the subject matter is or the client name, and then what it is. So for example, for today's video, uh, 2016, 0104, underscore, and then I put in KSM for Keep Shooting Monday, or if it was for a client, I would do that, and then another underscore, and then video. Then inside of that folder, I actually create another folder with that stream structure, but instead of doing video at the end, I actually will change it to footage because that's what this is. This is video footage, that kind of thing. If it was photographs, then it would be underscore raw. What that allows me to do is put my contracts in the top level folder and any kind of other you know, miscellaneous stuff in that top level folder. Then I'll create a raw folder, a PSD folder. If I really wanted to keep any exported JPEGs, which is probably pretty rare, then I'll create a JPEG folder for them, put everything in there, and it just makes a huge difference when you're finding stuff in Lightroom. You know that your most recent stuff is down at the bottom of the folder window on the left side in Lightroom, which is really nice, and it just makes a big difference when you're, when you're organizing and staying organized. So that's number one. Number two, Move your, let's talk about your backup. Uh, a lot of people don't do it. They don't have any kind of a decent backup or it's not regular or it's just, uh, you know, it's not a, it's not good enough. You know, you got to take another step to make sure that your photos are not, are backed up and are not susceptible to loss. Number one, what I recommend is pull all of your photos off of your primary operating system drive. Um, Keep a couple of them on there if you really need it, if you have a laptop, but put primarily work from an external drive. Uh, any of the newer computers have USB 3, which means it's gonna be a faster accessing them. So that's the way to go. You wanna move them off of there whenever possible. It's also gonna make Lightroom faster or Photoshop faster when you're accessing them on a, on a secondary drive. Uh, so the, overall, it's, it's a good thing for performance too. The next thing you wanna do is set up that second hard drive for your backup. Super important to have at least two copies of your photos. If you can do it, go for a third copy of your photos. Um, when you're pricing out hard drives, 
take a look at the price per gigabyte, you'll notice that the larger the drive, the lower the price per gigabyte. Typically, uh, the four gigabyte ones are really, really inexpensive right now. Gives you a lot of space. Uh, if you don't have a, a, a holder where you can actually do, or if you wanted a bare drive and save a little bit of money, well, I call this a toaster. Uh, I didn't think to grab it until just now. I call this a toaster. What you can do is just drop a bare drive right in there, and uh, then you can save a little bit of money on, on the case, and it'll, you can easily swap them in and out and move them around. This is actually an older one that's USB 2.0, but you can get another one that's USB 3 uh, so that you have a little bit uh, faster write speeds, that kind of thing. So uh, they're really nice to have and um, m makes it less, less expensive, especially if you have a laptop, then you don't need to buy the external case for each of those drives. You can just buy a bare drive and drop it in here. Uh, obviously, you need to protect it and be careful with it. I'll put up a link to one of those so that you can, uh, you can grab one. Uh, so set up that second, third backup, uh, and of course, set up your naming. Any questions on any of that, let me know. I'll gladly help you out. Super important, definitely the best way to go. And I actually talked about this years ago in a Lightroom video as far as my workflow and naming and importing and all that stuff. I don't let Lightroom import my photos. I actually do that inside of Explorer or Finder depending upon which computer that I'm working on. And so that's the, the way to go there. So um, this week I also moved all of my photos into one Lightroom catalog. Um, I have to say the performance is terrible when you have this big catalog. I thought for sure that it wouldn't be as bad as it is. And I'm actually thinking about just going back to individual catalogs or maybe I'll just keep my you know, my most recent three or four years in a single catalog and then have my older stuff, just keep them in, a, in another old, second older catalog. I don't know what I'm going to do right now. I have over 185,000 videos and photos inside of the one catalog. It is much slower to load. It is much slower when I'm searching. Um, the, just the catalog file is 3.6 gigabytes and it's on a RAID drive, which is super fast. So it's not like it's on any kind of a slow drive or anything like that. Granted, if it was a little bit, it might have a small step faster if I had put it on an SSD. But um, the two drives that it's on are actually in a RAID set up for the highest performance RAID that I can get, as well as they're also 10,000 RPM disks, which means that they're super fast disks in the first place. So um, you know, there, there's not going to be a performance issue as far as the disk is concerned. Same with the machine. I'm working with an i7 processor that's clocked at over four gigahertz with 32 gigabytes of RAM, and it's still only running at 10 to 20 percent CPU and two and a half gigs of RAM when I'm importing. So there's plenty of additional resources for this thing to run and do what it can do, uh, but it's not taking advantage of it. Uh, something else that I noticed is that it's not taking advantage of my NVIDIA graphics card. It's only using the onboard graphics card, which is the Intel one, which I'm surprised at. I don't see why, you know, like Premiere and Adobe, uh, Photoshop all can use the additional onboard, uh, the, I guess they con call it considered a discrete graphics card, the additional one, that's not just the onboard. But for some reason, it's now there, you know, it, it'll only take advantage of that Intel one, which is surprising to me. Um, I will say it was nice for that week to have all the photos in one place and not be swapping back and forth in between, but it's just too slow. I just, I, I, you know, I'm sitting there and it's chugging and it's chugging and it's chugging and I find myself then going to have to do something else and come back to it because I don't want to wait for it. And so I just cannot spend that time waiting on it. I was hoping that it was going to be a much better performance, but it's not. So hopefully they can do something this year. And uh, by the way, let me know about your Lightroom 7 wishlist items for this year. I'd love to know what those are. I talked about mine in a video last week. Let me know what, uh, what suggestions you have. I'll probably review a lot of those ones that you guys have in next week's show. I think it might be a good show. So uh, anyway, a little bit of news. Phase 1 came out with 100 megapixel... 100, let me emphasize that, 100 megapixel medium format camera back. Uh, it uses actually a Sony sensor. Sony's sensor division must be amazing because everybody is just 
going after this their work, and it's just really, really good. Um, it's a 645 format, which is uh, the same as a 4x5 photo, 8x10 photo, which is normal for medium format, if, if you guys don't know that. Um, has 16-bit color. If uh, all of the Nikon cameras that are out there, the Canon cameras, they have 14-bit. Uh, you can turn on the 14-bit. The regular is 12. You can turn on 14 for some, some additional data. These guys are going up to 16, which that really is a huge file with 15 stops of dynamic range with an ISO of 50 to 12,800 and quote unquote clean files all the way through that range, which is which will be impressive. I haven't seen any low light images yet, which will be interesting, but um, 100 megapixels. I could not imagine, you know, a file. You're talking about a, a file that gets exported that's close to a gigabyte for one single picture. So you you know you're gonna you're gonna fill a drive in no time shooting a bunch of these images. So you really need to have not only the the forty five thousand dollars to buy this this back, then you also need to put it on a camera and have lenses, and then you need the the computers and equipment in order to handle it and the storage and all that. So you're talking about probably a hundred and fifty thousand dollar nut in order to get into this. So you really need to be a super high end or be able to rent it, which is probably what a lot of people would do. Um, it's interesting though. It, it's good that they're pushing it. As I've always said, it's great to have that innovation. I don't ever see myself getting one of those. How about you? Let me know. Uh, Petapixel did a, a nice little article where they uh, talked about locking up gear in your car. And I've actually done this. Um, Basically, what I did in my Suburban is, is there's little tie-downs in the back so that if you're carrying anything heavy, you don't want it to move, roll around, you can actually tie it down. And I took my uh, Pelican case and I locked it up inside of there, so I've actually done that. Like when I'm staying at a hotel or something like that, like when I'm going to, to different places, sometimes I need extra gear and I don't want to carry it all with me, but I don't want to lose it. So what I'll, I'll leave it in the truck, but I'll lock it up so that... Basically, the goal here is just to slow people down. You know, if somebody's going to steal something, they want to be in and out before somebody can see them. And it might be quick to be able to pop your trunk, that kind of thing, uh, or get into the, you know, pop the lock in your car and then hit the trunk button. But if you're slowing them down by attaching that bag to uh, either a tie down in the back of, a, of an SUV or to the, uh, the trunk hinge, just like, as they show in this photo, on Petapixel, it's going to slow them down. There's a, a better chance of your stuff not getting stolen. So uh, then obviously you need a locking bag, that kind of thing, which you can get a lot of those from Think Tank Photo. They make some really amazing bags. Or you can just toss everything inside of a big, huge uh, suitcase, that kind of thing can, can all uh, work. You probably might already have a suitcase and a lock for your suitcase, so that might be another way to go too. At least slow them down and you have a better chance of your stuff not getting stolen. Obviously, the best thing to do is make sure you have insurance, which is super important, too. Last thing I thought I'd talk about in the news, it's actually an older post, but I just saw it kind of circulate around again, uh, which are some really cool shortcut sheets for a lot of different apps. And what I actually ended up doing is I printed them out and I laminated them. So I uh, printed them out. This one's for Photoshop, and then these three or for Lightroom. I was surprised at the number of shortcuts there are for a Lightroom. Um, what I probably should have done before I laminated them, though, I just thought about this, is highlight some of them, <laughs> uh, you know, with a highlighter. So I may end up doing it again, especially on the white ones here in Photoshop or in Lightroom. Man, there's just so many of them. Um, maybe I'll just light, uh, highlight them on the computer. I don't know. Anyway, you know, the font is, is just a touch small when printed out on this size paper. Um, anyway, it's nice to have them all in one place. And so it's it, just a really cool little cheat sheet. Gives you some of the major shortcuts. And so it should save some time. I Now I have them. I can, when I'm working in Lightroom or Photoshop, I can just pull them up, sit them on a desk next to me. And so I'll have them ready to go. So, uh, Cool little thing from setupablogtoday.com. Check out their link and download them for yourself. So I have a couple of gazillion questions. We'll go over them in a minute.
Greg, have you ever had any issues with clients or have been sued that you care to share? I recently shot a model that signed a model release form, but she asked me to take down her photos. She wanted to make her taller and a whole bunch of other things. Should I honor the request and just throw out a lot of photos? Also, I paid to shoot her not much, but still paid. All right, so first, knock on wood. No, I've never been sued. I hope it never happens. Knocking on wood or concrete, whatever you call it, okay? Uh, I hope it never happens. I've been lucky in that regard. So uh, I think it's a lot of it has to do with a good clients. Um, when you pick and choose and you're able to have work, work with good clients all the time, you know, that, that goes a long way. And understanding people, and you know, you do your best to, to help them out if there is an issue or, or bend over backwards if there is an issue or problem. You know, that's the, the, the way to go and to, to kind of keep those issues at bay. Uh, as far as yours, you paid, let me get this straight, you paid to shoot her, she signed a model release with you, and then she wants you, she told you, she told you to take down the photos, and then she wants you to do additional editing and make her look taller so that she can use the photos. That definitely sounds like a pretty messed up situation. In that instance, I would definitely put it, say, look, you know, you've got to pay me for this additional time to do to do any of this editing. And you're and since now you're you don't want me, even though I have a signed model release, you don't want me to share these photos that I paid you to take the the you know to model for. I would definitely start bartering and say, look, I'm not doing any additional work on this until you you know, you allow me to honor this because it's possible that they're going to find some scummy lawyer somewhere to do, you know, to sue you. And, you know, even if they don't win, they're still going to waste your time, waste your money, go through all the hassle. It's just not worth it. Um, <clears throat> so I don't know, dude. Good luck. <laughs> I, I, I don't I don't think I would uh, bother helping her out in, in the least at all. I think I'd just be done with it and just wipe my hands of it and, you know, be it, be done. So probably the the best thing to do. You know, if she wants to go look taller, just say, you know, have fun, go find another photographer. I'm I'm not I'm not doing any additional work for you for free. At 11 minutes, you mentioned not putting it on glass directly. Can you please explain? Is there a transparent coat slash sheet that you place in between the glass and the photo? Sundeep was referring to my video where I talked to Epson at the show about the their new Epson Legacy Fine Art papers. And at one point, we talked a little bit about framing, and uh, it's actually a bad practice to take a photo and put it right behind glass and then put it inside of a frame. That's what everyone does when you go and buy a, uh, you know, a smaller picture frame, a 5x7, an 8x10, whatever, and it's actually the wrong thing to do. Um, you should not do that, because what happens is that will, over time, stick, especially the shinier, photo, the, like a glossy or a um, a satin or a luster paper will over time stick to that glass. Your matte papers tend not to, your thicker papers tend not to, uh, but your normal photo papers that you print most of your photos on, like a luster or glossy, like I said, they were, will tend to stick to that, those, uh, that glass very quickly over only in a few months time and it's stuck on there and you go to put peel it up, you end up peeling some of the, the, the emulsion back or some of you know, the ink off and it's on the glass and so it ruins the photo. So the best thing to do, and if you're taking your photos to a picture framer, they should know to do this. If not, you can send your photos to my picture framer. Uh, I'll put a link in there for her shameless plug that she asked me to give her. This, that is the right thing to do is to make sure that that photo is not adhered and stuck directly behind the glass. Now, when you're putting a photo inside of a mat and then inside of the frame, it's easy. You just dry mount the photo so that it's stuck onto the, the actual uh, a substrate, a foam core, or something like that. Then you put your mat on top of that. Then you put it inside of the frame. Simple but it's a little bit more difficult when the photo goes all the way to the edges. The way to get around that is actually to cut a thin strip of foam core or a thin strip of matte paper or something like that, glue that to the, uh, or stick that on the inside of the frame in between the glass and the photo. And the key to this is, 
especially for small, even 8x10 photos. Maybe a 5x7, you could get away with it. 8x10, 11x14, especially 16x20s. You really need to make sure that you're dry mounting that photo, sticking it to something, or if you absolutely have to, but it's even though it's not the, right, the best way to go, um, use a spray mount. It'll work. It is archival, but it's definitely not the best way to go. So dry mount is, is the better way to mount it. So mount it on there, on that board, so that it's not going to come off. It's not going to wrinkle or pee or, you know, it's not going to get weird in there. Because over time, the different heating and cooling, all those, you know, the different substances in there uh, stretch and um, contract at different rates. So you need to think about that. Anyway, you take that thin little strip, you drop, you cut it down, you drop it in there on the edge, and I'll show you the photos that are here. Um, drop it in there. Once you cut it down, stick it in around the edges, then put your photo in there with the glass, and that's the right way to do it. And it'll give you a little bit more distance. Again, it doesn't need to be much, just a hair. It's just a, just a little bit to leave that little bit of distance in there. And so that'll uh, make all the difference in the world. Make sure you don't have any issues. Make sure that that photo lasts a lot longer. If you did have any questions, find a good picture framer. Stay away from the big box stores, the Michaels, the AC Moore, any of those kinds of stores. You know, the um, go to a real framing place um, or contact Bridget. She'll take care of you too. She'll ship wherever she needs to ship to and uh, just flood her inbox with requests, please. Would it be awesome if she had like 50 requests all of a sudden from you guys to, with questions and you know, work for her? That'd be really cool to, to, to pass that business along and a little bit of, uh, of goodwill. So let's see if that actually happens. <laughs> I know it's a little tough this time of the year because the holidays are over and all, but it would still be fun. So I think that is it for Keep Shooting Monday, number 115. Any questions or anything, please let me know. I'd love to answer more of them. As always, I enjoy it. Make sure that you guys work on your, uh, your archive and your New Year's resolutions that I suggested. Make sure you have that good backup. And check out the website. Let me know what you think on there. And share all of my videos. Please share them. Share my links. I would really, really appreciate it. Thanks, guys. Keep shooting.